Good morning. I'm Savannah Sellers. And I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, armed and anxious. Stark new orders handed down from the State Department for Americans in Ukraine as military tensions with Russia intensify. Family members of U.S. Embassy staffers in Kiev advised to evacuate immediately as Americans across the globe are warned not to travel to the embattled region. President Biden meeting with his top military brass at Camp David over the weekend, the latest on a potential U.S. response if Russia invades. Shot strike. New COVID cases here on the East Coast begin to plateau from holiday highs. In Washington, thousands of anti-vaccine demonstrators marched through the nation's capital Sunday, a rallying cry to, quote, defeat the mandates. Battle over the shots still red hot as some parts of the country experience a slight COVID reprieve compared to recent weeks. But other regions are still in the thick of Omicron surge with hospitals out west and down south running on empty. We will bring you the latest on COVID on this Monday morning. Let's get ready to refund. Today marks the official start of, you guessed it, tax season 2022. The pandemic is obviously still with us, causing all sorts of clerical complications when it comes to filing those returns. So we're going to walk you through everything you need to know this year to get the most out of that highly revered refund. And go easy on me after the positively heartbreaking postponement of Adele's hotly anticipated Vegas residency, a handful of down on their luck fans got an unexpected hello. Socially distanced surprise that only one of the world's biggest pop icons could pull off by that whole postponement thing might now be water under the bridge <laughs> for some of those lucky fans. See what you did there. It was quite the moment for them who had flown to Vegas <laughs> only to find out I they know. were leaving without seeing Adele. So, yeah, I know. I can't wait to hear more about yeah, that. Yeah, hear more of their enthusiasm. Some good news on that story. We're going to begin this hour with the growing crisis along the border of Russia and Ukraine. Yeah, President Biden is now considering several options, including deploying troops if Russia does invade its neighbor. Meantime, the State Department overnight ordered the families of U.S. diplomats to leave Kiev, warning Americans not to travel to Ukraine or Russia. NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell is following the latest. Good morning. Officials tell us the president is looking at plans by air, by sea, and on the ground to fortify NATO allies in Eastern Europe, not send these assets into Ukraine. The mission is to deter Putin and protect our NATO partners. And I'm told conversations have begun with the countries that could receive this U.S. military support, which may be one tangible sign that the president's decision-making process is moving forward. This morning, President Biden weighing a new military operation to counter Vladimir Putin and bolster NATO allies in Europe. At Camp David Saturday, the president was briefed on potential U.S. troop and equipment movements to NATO countries in Eastern Europe. Administration officials say Defense Secretary Austin, on video conference, laid out options for the president to act before or after any Russian invasion of Ukraine. A decision could come within days. We'll continue to build up uh, the defense and deterrence that uh, is necessary. And a new warning. Americans in Ukraine ordered home, including families of embassy staff in Kyiv, and a voluntary departure for non-essential workers due to the continued threat of Russian military action. Let there be no doubt at all that if Putin makes this choice, Russia will pay a heavy price. Great Britain revealed its discovery of a brewing Russian plot to overthrow the democratically elected president of Ukraine and install a former Ukraine official close to Moscow. The U.S. called that deeply concerning and put Russia on notice. There is going to be a swift, a severe and united response. While Putin has moved more than 100,000 Russian troops to Ukraine's border, the U.S. has delivered $200 million of lethal military aid to Ukraine. And negotiations continue. Lawmakers say sanctions should not wait. We do need to go ahead and impose sanctions on Russia now. We need to show them that we mean business. While President Biden considers his military options, today NATO's Secretary General announced that the Alliance of Nations is putting some forces on standby, sending additional ships and fighter jets to Eastern Europe, and would welcome the support of other allies to contribute forces for deterrence. Back to you. All right, Kelly O'Donnell, thanks so much.
Now to rising tensions over the nation's handling of the COVID pandemic, thousands of protesters descended on Washington on Sunday to rally against the Biden administration's push for more vaccine mandates. The protests come as Omicron continues to overwhelm hospitals in the South and West. Well, cases in the Northeast are showing promising signs of recovery. Experts warn we're not over COVID just yet. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer has the latest. As our nation surpasses 70 million infections just here in the United States, there are signs of good news in pockets of the country, specifically the Northeast. Cases are dropping rapidly, but in other parts of the country, like here out west, they're still on the rise. This morning, the battle over vaccines playing out in the nation's capital. On Sunday, crowds of demonstrators, led by speakers including Robert F. Kennedy Jr., marched from the Washington Monument to the Lincoln Memorial in an effort to defeat the mandates. I feel like to coerce somebody to make that decision is really unjust. The rally comes days after a Virginia woman was arrested after she appeared to threaten officials at a school board meeting over mass Mandates. My child, my children will not come to school on Monday with a mask on. All right. That's not happening. And I will bring every single gun loaded and ready. The nation's deep division comes as COVID cases are finally starting to fall after weeks of skyrocketing case counts driven by Omicron. The national average of daily new cases down 10 percent compared to a week ago don't want to get overconfident, but they all look like they're going in the right direction right now. In New York, once the nation's COVID epicenter, the governor citing a 66 percent drop in just the last two weeks. This is extraordinary progress. But cases in southern and western states where Omicron hit later continue to go up as hospitals are overrun. In California, the number of COVID positive patients in intensive care has ballooned more than 60 percent in the last two weeks. At Sharp Grossmont Hospital in San Diego, the staff is exhausted. Are you surprised that things are this bad? You know, I, I want to say no. But deep down, I was hoping we'd never be back here again. With Pfizer and Moderna still working on a COVID vaccine for children under five, there seems to be some progress. Experts say by mid to late March, one could be available. Back to you. Miguel Almaguer, thank you. Let's bring in NBC News medical contributor Dr. Uche Blockstock. She's an emergency medicine physician and the CEO of Advancing Health Equity. Doctor, always great to have you with us. I'm going to actually ask you a question about what Miguel just ended on there in just a moment. But first, I want to get your take on what we were just hearing there with these numbers getting better in cases that were hit first. We actually heard Dr. Fauci use the term live vaccine last week and said it's getting a lot of people immunity because of how quickly it spread. Do you see light at the end of the tunnel here? What's your take on what we could be seeing? in the next month or so. Thank you so much for having me on, Savannah. So I, I do think that, you know, while it's reassuring we're seeing a decrease in cases in the Northeast, we still have to really wonder how long the tail of this surge is going to be. We still have hospitalizations that are quite high, even in the Northeast, as cases rise um, in the West and the Midwest. So, so I'm concerned that we're still going to have a lot of hospitalized patients for a while, and that after that, because death is a, is a lagging, lagging indicator, we're going to see an, an increase um, in, in deaths. I'm concerned just really about how are we going to prepare for the next surge. And so while it's reassuring, we're the numbers come down. And that's a combination of virus biology, social networks, um, and human behavior. And that's why we are seeing these cases come down. I'm concerned and we need to be prepared for the next surge. Let's now go to a viewer question about what we just heard from Miguel. Now, this, this is from Srini Vas Gorpade in California. So as Miguel mentioned, that these vaccines for kids under five years old could come in March. Srini Vas wants to know, what is taking so long for the two to five-year-old's vaccine approval for COVID? Which I think is a great question because I think it kind of sheds light on the confusion here yeah. that a lot of people feel about how are these developed in what timing? Right. And I know there are a lot of frustrated parents of under five-year-old kids out there, but people should know that this, you know, Pfizer and Moderna and FDA are doing their due diligence. In December, we got that data on two to five-year-olds that they did not have an adequate response from the vaccine. So Pfizer went back and they're now uh, testing a third dose to see if that will provide an adequate response in two to five-year-olds. I think for the six-month to two-year-olds that did have that adequate response by Pfizer, I know parents out there are wondering, but I think they'll have to wait a little bit longer because 
Pfizer will want to make sure that the vaccine works well in older kids first. Mm. Finally, we're learning new information about what we originally called flu-rona. <laughs> new research is suggesting flu-rona may not be a real thing, but catching two viruses is still a very real possibility. I mean, walk us through what that distinction there means and what does it really mean to have these two viruses interacting in the right. body at the same time? So yeah, definitely co-infection with both flu and coronavirus can happen, and it's been documented, although it is quite rare. I think what you know the, the hype over Florona shows us is that it's really important for people to get vaccinated, especially the vulnerable. So vaccines for flu are available and for coronavirus are available, and I just recommend people to get them. We're headed into the flu season, um, the, the worst of the flu season now, so it's a time when people should get vaccinated to prevent getting this co-infection with both viruses. All right. Great information there, Dr. Uche Blackstack. As always, thank you so much for your time. And now, if you have a question for one of our doctors, please let us know they are ready to answer your questions. Email us at morningnewsnow at NBCUNI.com. We are reading your questions. We are asking them your questions. And you can also let us know if you want to stay anonymous. It was a violent weekend in New York City as an NYPD officer was killed and another officer seriously injured in a shooting. The city has seen an uptick in violence during this first month of the year. NBC News correspondent Stephanie Goss joins us now with more. Stephanie, good morning. Joe, good morning. Gun violence in this city is up 16 percent compared to this time last year. Governor Hochul and Mayor Adams have promised quick action. The mayor calling this most recent police killing an attack on the city. This weekend, police departments on edge after officers were shot in multiple cities. There's an officer got shot and took off. Houston police grieving one of their own after a traffic stop turned deadly. In D.C., police responded to a man acting suspiciously and he opened fire. One officer sustained non-life-threatening injuries. All of this as New York is now a city in mourning. And it hurts my heart. It really does. Hundreds lining the streets as the body of 22-year-old officer Jason Rivera was escorted from the medical examiner's office. His partner, 27-year-old Wilbert Mora, is in critical condition. Both were investigating a domestic disturbance in Harlem when a suspect shot them. Police say 47-year-old LaShawn McNeil fired on the officers inside his mother's apartment. At the scene, police recovered a stolen Glock pistol with an extended magazine that holds up to 40 rounds. Violence against New Yorkers. That's the battle we're in right now. Mayor Eric Adams now pleading for federal help to get guns off the city streets. It appears as though for every gun we remove from the street, five are coming in. Five NYPD officers have been shot in just the first three weeks of this year. And in East Harlem, a 19-year-old Burger King employee was shot and killed when the shooter tried to rob the restaurant. It was her last week on the night shift. Just days ago, an 11-month-old girl was struck in the face by a stray bullet in the Bronx. In response, Mayor Adams says he will reinstate controversial anti-gun units staffed by plainclothes officers. But today, the city remembers a young man tragically lost. Jason, love you. You will always be remembered. Always. Officer Rivera's funeral will take place at St. Patrick's Cathedral. In a letter he wrote to a police academy official, he wanted to become a police officer to better the relationship between the community and the force. He barely got a chance to do that. Guys, back to you. All right. Stephanie, thanks so much. Opening statements will begin today in the federal trial of three former Minneapolis police officers who were at the scene of George Floyd's fatal arrest. The officers are accused of depriving Floyd of his constitutional rights. NBC News correspondent Megan Fitzgerald joins us now from outside the courthouse in St. Paul, Minnesota. Hi, Megan. Good morning. Savannah, good morning. You know, it's been nearly 20 months since George Floyd's death, and now those three other officers are set to stand trial facing federal charges uh, for not stopping Derek Chauvin and for not rendering aid when they saw that George Floyd was in need of medical help. Uh, now, a jury has been seated here, and in just a couple of hours, opening statements are set to get underway. This morning, George Floyd's death is back in the national spotlight, with opening statements set to begin today in the federal trial against three former Minneapolis police officers charged in connection to Floyd's killing. Prosecutors say Thomas Lane, J. Alexander King, and Tu Tao deprived Floyd of his civil rights when they saw George Floyd lying on the ground in clear need of medical care and willfully failed to aid Floyd. 
Prosecutors also say King and Tao willfully failed to intervene as fellow officer Derek Chauvin knelt on Floyd's neck for more than nine minutes. All three officers have pleaded not guilty to the charges. Considering the fact that he moaned in agony, that he could not breathe for minutes on end until he passed, I believe proved the fact that they denied him of his civil rights. Twelve jurors, along with six alternates, have been chosen from across the state of Minnesota to decide the high-profile case. Of the 12 seated jurors, seven are women and five are men. The majority of the panel appear to be white. Prosecutors must prove that the officers intentionally deprived Floyd of his constitutional rights during his fatal arrest in May of 2020. As Chauvin knelt on Floyd's neck, police body cam footage and bystander video show King and Lane helping to restrain Floyd while Tao kept crowds at bay. Floyd's death sparking a national reckoning on social justice. Chauvin is currently serving a 22 and a half year prison sentence after being found guilty of Floyd's murder in a separate state trial last April. He is not part of this federal trial after pleading guilty to two civil rights violations last month. Now, this is the first of two trials for these former Minneapolis police officers. They're also facing state murder charges. That trial is expected to begin in June. Savannah. All right, Megan, thank you so much. Let's get a check on your morning news now weather. Which means Bill Karens is back, and I think last hour he said he's going to tell us about more snow. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to talk. I don't want to. I guess I have to. Um, yeah, this snow was, uh, yeah, it's just that time of winter where it's kind of like, all right, let's wrap this up. Um, but let's get into it. People, some people love snow. I, I don't want to upset those people. People love to get on their snowmobiles. I went skiing this weekend. It was fun. Um, but, you yeah, know, again, sooner or later, it does have to melt. Uh, so this is Lake County, Indiana, and this was uh, one of those snow belt areas, and they had about five to six inches over the weekend. They're going to get another about one to three this morning. And, uh, yeah, that's what you, yeah, parking out in the road, that's uh, what you, sometimes you don't like that. Got to dig out extra. All right, so let's get into the forecast for today. And it's a cold morning all the way down to the Sunshine State, so everyone's kind of feeling this winter pain right now. Nine million people impacted. We're all the way down to the 20s in some spots. It's 30 in Jacksonville, Florida. Panama City's at 29. We didn't see the freeze line going below I-4, so Tampa, you're 45 degrees. But even by Miami standards, 47 degrees is a pretty frigid morning. That, I want to talk about frigid, though. We have to go to the northern plains. It's another cold morning in northern New England. Burlington's at negative 5, International Falls. They call it the icebox. Negative 20 degrees, living up to that reputation this morning. And as we go throughout this week, that cold blast that's now coming down today in Fargo, that's going to have its eyes set on the Midwest tomorrow. So Chicago, very cold day tomorrow. High of only 12 degrees. Wind chill will be below zero for most of the day. And then... It heads our way. New York looks like Wednesday, Thursday, both days, not even getting out of the 20s. That's the high temperature, so the lows will be in the single digits or the teens. It's going to be a very cold middle of the week. So we don't have a ton of snow out there today. Just a little bit there, as we mentioned, Chicago near Indiana, heading into areas like Detroit. Bottom half of the country, a little bit of rain in Texas and New Orleans. And then for tomorrow, enjoy that 41 in New York, guys, tomorrow, because that cold moves in Wednesday. So, uh, yeah, tomorrow I'll talk more about that potential storm on Saturday. I'm just complaining way too much. It's a cold Monday. The, uh, everyone's up late with the football game. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's January. We need a little snow, so I'm, I'm fine with it. Yeah, I'm good. me too. Yesterday's okay. was pretty. <laughs> yeah, you, guys be the, you guys be the positive ones yeah. today. Yeah. I'll here. take up all the all negative right, energy. There we yeah. go. <laughs> like a battery. All right. <laughs> hey, thanks, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> and coming up, an intimate look at the heartbreak and horror of Afghan citizens struggling to flee a country under Taliban rule. We'll have the incredible rescue of one West Point grad in Kabul. That's next. Welcome back. It's been five months since U.S. troops made that chaotic final withdrawal from Afghanistan, ending America's longest war. In those last days, as the Taliban took over, we witnessed heartbreaking scenes of Afghans struggling to flee. Today's show anchor Craig Melvin brings us the incredible story of how one rescue gave rise to a veterans group that helped hundreds. The final moments of war. 
As American troops were leaving, thousands of Afghans rushed to the Kabul airport with a Taliban moving in to take control. Many U.S. military veterans, having Afghan allies and friends, felt compelled to do something. Among them are Barrett Ward and Caleb McDaniel. Caleb's former roommate and Barrett's former student was 2016 West Point graduate Shabir Kabiri. He was one of a handful of foreign students accepted to study at West Point every year. And when they saw the crisis unfolding, they reached out to Shabir. Why were you so worried? Because I knew that he, you know, had gone to West Point, that he had served alongside, you know, Americans, you know, made him p possibly a target. Barrett, when did you start to get a little concerned? I texted Shabir and said, hey, I just want to make sure you got out OK. He re responded almost immediately to my text. And he said, no, sir, um, we are not OK. With time running out, Shabir's friends knew he had only one option left. Called Shabir, and I said, Shabir, I, this is really hard, but you need to take whatever you have right now, and you need to get to the airport as soon as possible. In Kabul, Shabir at first thought Caleb was joking. Wait, they are serious. Get to the airport with my family? And it took me a few minutes to process, but then I said, all right, I'm ready, but how to tell this to my family? Shabir managed to convince his parents and five younger siblings that they needed to leave immediately. Shabir's friends in America knew he needed help to get through the gates of the airport. The scene there, utter chaos. So Caleb and Barrett started working their contacts made at West Point. Who are you calling? Who are you texting? We got some random numbers that started coming through from our contacts, and we were cold calling them and saying, we have this guy, you need to get him through. So you're texting back and forth with Caleb and Barrett. What are they saying to you, and what are you saying to them? I was panicking. It was tough. I had my family. I brought them to a situation where the crowd would just shove in. I had my younger siblings. I had a sister-in-law who was pregnant. Caleb and Barrett managed to contact the U.S. commander at the airport gate and aware that soldiers from the Afghan army were about to shoot into the air to disperse the crowd, Shabir's American friends texted him to use that opportunity to get to the gate. While everyone else ran, he and his family were escorted to safety. During this whole journey, I was thinking, like, movies are real, movies are real, because I was experiencing it. There's just a single fence, a metal fence, and once we cross that, there was the sign of relief. All right, I think we are safe now. Shabir and his family now live in Maryland. He's got a job. His brother's baby was born in November. An American son. Long time no see. How are you doing, brother? <laughs> and on the day we talked to them, the three friends were reunited for the first time in six years. Yeah, how's this for your brother oh, you so and much. your new nephew? Awesome, yeah, so. but he, they're growing fast. The efforts to get Shabir and another Afghan classmate out gave birth to Allied Airlift 21, a group of hundreds of volunteers and civilians working to help vet the Afghan allies they knew and navigate them to safety. Allied Airlift 21 says it helped get about 700 Afghan allies to safety before U.S. troops departed from Kabul airport at the end of August. Each of those refugees is now starting over, safe but far from home. What is your hope for your life here and their lives here? My sisters are learning riding bike. They didn't get a chance to ride bike back home. Every small thing that they do, and I said, all right, it was worth it. Wow, our thanks to Craig Melvin for that incredible story. Let's take a look at what else is making news around the world this morning. Ali Aruzi is back with us from Tehran. Hey, Ali. Good morning, Savannah and Joe. Well, WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange will be able to go to the Supreme Court to challenge a decision allowing him to be extradited to the United States. However, it refused him permission for a direct appeal, meaning the Supreme Court will have to decide whether or not it should hear his challenge. Iconic French fashion designer Thierry Mugler has died at the age of 73 of natural causes. He was an avant-garde known for his bold collections that came to define the 1980s power dressing. Uh, the former ballet dancer was responsible for daring designs worn by Demi Moore, Beyonce, Lady Gaga and many more. And Friday will never be the same in Dubai. 
The United Emirates will shift its weekends from Friday and Saturday to Saturday and Sunday, a move to align with global markets and Western schedules, throwing Dubai's beloved Friday brunch, a key revenue source for COVID-19 battered restaurants, into disarray. And those are oh. your headlines, guys. Maybe, maybe they can do Sunday brunch. I'm not sure. And Saturday brunch. Yeah, <laughs> go for two brunches. <laughs> right? right? I mean, yeah. People on Friday. Come for that. There you go. Yeah, brunch. just keep yeah. Friday too. There you yeah, go. Exactly. We should add Friday. All right. We got a plan. <laughs> Allie, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Coming up, a new weapon of choice for some of America's most violent criminals. Why ghost guns, as they're known, are causing top law enforcement officials to raise a red flag. That's up next. Welcome back. There was a scene that has people talking from last night's season six premiere of Showtime's Billions. Now, if you're a fan of the show and haven't watched the episode yet, now's your chance to run or mute because there's a spoiler ahead. During the episode, the character Mike Wagner suffers a heart attack while riding a Peloton bike with his instructor. But unlike a similar scene in the Sex and the City reboot, the character survives the health scare. Showtime tells USA Today the Billions plot was a coincidence. So what did Peloton make of it? Well, in response to the episode, the company released a statement saying in part, quote, we did not agree for our brand to be used on this show or provide any equipment. As referenced by the show, there are strong benefits of cardiovascular exercise to help people lead long, happy lives. Now, of course, you might remember on the Sex and the City reboot, Chris Noth's character, Mr. Big, died of a heart attack following a ride. And Peloton really just can't catch a break. Can't catch a break. You have to wonder if anyone else out there is writing a, a screenplay and they're like, oh, maybe we'll, yeah, yeah, <laughs> we'll, yeah. we'll find a different way for them to have yeah, a Yeah, we're going to scrap this plan. Yeah, oh, exactly. I know. All right. Feel for them. It's just like they no keep kidding. coming up. All right. Thanks, Savannah. <laughs> yeah. An alarming new trend is law enforcement and government officials sounding the alarm. A growing number of police departments say homemade firearms or ghost guns are becoming more common on the streets of many cities. An NBC News investigation found instructions for making these unregistered weapons at home can be found easily on websites like YouTube. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin joins us now with more. Aaron, good morning. Joe, good morning. Across the country, crime is on the rise, and authorities say increasingly criminals have a new tool to help them break the law, so-called ghost guns or untraceable firearms. Police say one was used by a teenager in a high school shooting that left another student critically injured. The shooter was just 17 years old. This morning, a 17-year-old student facing second-degree murder is expected in court. After this terrifying scene unfolded at a Maryland high school Friday. There was kids stuck in classrooms, closets, you know. The high school junior allegedly shot a 15-year-old sophomore who was injured but is expected to survive, say authorities. Police have charged the shooter as an adult and say the weapon he used was a ghost gun, a kind of build-it-yourself firearm that has no serial number and is nearly impossible to trace. Authorities say ghost guns are quickly becoming the criminal's weapon of choice and instructions to make them live online. An NBC News investigation found three years after YouTube banned ghost gun tutorials, dozens of videos with step-by-step -step directions for building the weapons were still on the site. YouTube says its guidelines prohibit such content and has since taken down the posts we flagged for violating its firearms policy. These guns can shoot just like any other gun because that's what it is but it's not serialized. Police say ghost gun kits are readily available on mainstream platforms, and a legal loophole allows anyone to buy one without a background check, including convicted felons, even children. That's because the kits only contain partially completed gun parts. It's not until the kit begins to be assembled that it's considered a firearm and possibly illegal. And you can see the holes where the specific drill locations are. And so when we come into a house and we see three or four of these sitting down in the kitchen, we know what's going on. They're building ghost guns. Nationwide, the number of seized ghost guns increased almost five times between 2016 and 2020. Last year in San Diego, the number has gone up more than tenfold since 2019. Police here are so alarmed, they've established one of the first ghost gun units in the country. We sat down with two of the unit's undercover agents. Who is attracted to these kinds of guns? I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's criminals that are attracted to it, right? It's people that don't want you to know that they have these guns. I mean, that's, that's the big thing. That's the big draw. And how difficult is it to make one of these guns? I mean, if you can do IKEA furniture, you can do this. It's about ease of access to these firearms. 
In 2019, Brian Mulberger's 14-year-old daughter, Gracie, was killed by a ghost gun during a school shooting outside of Los Angeles. Brian says he was able to find and purchase a ghost gun kit with his cell phone in minutes, using Gracie's name. It was really disheartening when a box showed up in my, in my mailbox and to my front door with my daughter's name on it. Do you feel you're making progress? Yeah, I do. I mean, just if you think about it, every gun that you get off the street, uh, there's a possible victim behind that gun. Even so, the detectives say technology is outpacing the law. The Internet is so much bigger now than it was even five, six years ago. And what you could get online and how it teaches you how to build these things. Ten states, including California and New York, have enacted laws to at least partially address the proliferation of ghost guns. The Justice Department has proposed a new federal rule that would regulate the sale of homemade gun kits like all other firearms, requiring buyers to pass background checks and force manufacturers to add serial numbers to parts. The rule is pending. Joe. All right, Aaron, thank you so much. And coming up on Morning News Now, tax season is upon us yet again, and we're breaking down all of the COVID complications and deadlines you could face when filing that return this year. Plus, have you ever heard of a cruise ship with a warrant out for its arrest? That's actually playing out this morning in the Bahamas. We're going to tell you all about the trouble in paradise. Next. Welcome back. Now, I hate to break it to you, but it is tax season again. And for a lot of us, filing taxes can be a real headache with a lot of questions and sometimes complications. The pandemic has not made things any easier, but it's still sticking around, creating more challenges this year. Here to walk us through what to know is U.S. tax policy reporter for The Wall Street Journal, Richard Rubin. Good to have you with us. So what are some important dates and changes to this year's tax season that Americans should know about? Yeah, so the first thing to know is today. Today's the first day when you can file your 2021 income tax return and the IRS will accept it uh, and then begin processing your return and refund. The end date this year is April 18th for most people. Um, that's when your taxes are due. Uh, you can always seek a six month extension. But remember the past two years, they've extended that deadline into May and June. This year, it'll be April 18th. It's not April 15th because of the Emancipation Day here in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, it's April 19th for people in Maine and Massachusetts. Oh, all right. Good to know that those dates are a little bit different. Now, Richard, we know the pandemic created a lot of different benefits for Americans. We saw the child tax credit, enhanced unemployment benefits. How should Americans go about claiming any type of credits on their returns this year? Yeah, the two big things are the child tax credits that people got in advance over the second half of last year, and also the $1,400 economic stimulus payments that people might have gotten in March. The IRS has sent out letters to uh, everyone uh, who got those over the past uh, month or so that lays out how much their records show that was sent. And that's important information to, that gets incorporated into your return so that you, you know, say you're owed a $3,000 child tax credit overall, you probably got 1,500 of that in advance. So then you're claiming the other 1,500 on the return. Mm -hmm. If that information all matches, things should move relatively smoothly. If it doesn't, then we might have some issues. Oof. Speaking of issues, Richard, we know the IRS has had its fair share of difficulties processing tax returns, mm -hmm. getting them into the hands of Americans recently. So what should people expect this year after so many delays and changes over the last two years because of the pandemic? Yeah, so the, the big distinction here is anything that requires paper or human hands is going to take a long time. The IRS is still backlogged from last year. If you file electronically, you ask for a refund through direct deposit, and there aren't any discrepancies or issues with your return, the IRS says you should still expect to get a refund within 21 days. If you get kicked into the other stream and you need you either file on paper or someone at the IRS needs to help resolve a particular issue for you, um, we're talking weeks or months more than that. And so um, it, it really could be quite a delay if if you're not in that quick stream of, of moving things. Oh, yeah. Thoughts and prayers with anyone waiting on the <laughs> answer from them this year. All right. Richard Rubin, thanks so much for your time this morning as we kick off tax season. Great. Thanks. Time now for our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. Bertha Coombs is back with us. Hey, Bertha. Hey, I just... 
screwed up my prompter, but <laughs> first of all, Citigroup is telling its employees that they need to be back by February 7th, and that's for New York-based employees as the Omicron uh, surge here in the greater New York metropolitan area has started to decline. Uh, they are going to take other areas, region by region, looking at the data, depending on what happens there. That's when they'll tell people to go back. Uh, they are saying that at this point, they are expecting people to come back at least two days per week. And recall that Citigroup also told people who were not vaccinated by the deadline this month that they would no longer be employed. So that's one to watch. And the rest I'm not sure of. I really apologize for having messed Bertha, that up. we got it's your script here. Monday so Monday morning. <laughs> we got your script here, so we'll pick why, it up for you. So why don't you guys go ahead? Yeah, if your bank <laughs> account is connected to a financial app like Robinhood, Acorns, or Venmo, you could be in line to get some cash. Fast Company reports Plaid, the service used by these apps, has settled a class action lawsuit. It alleges the company collected more user data than necessary and obtained their bank login through its own interface, which looks just like the login screen of a user's bank account. Plaid will pay $58 million. You may qualify if you connected an app to your account between 2013 and November of last year. And gas prices are inching up again. The average price of regular is up a penny over the last two weeks to $3.40 a gallon. That's nearly a dollar higher than a year ago. Analysts say prices could continue to rise as the cost of crude oil has gone up. Crude oil accounts for about half the price of a gallon of gas. Not as right. good as Bertha doing it, though. Yeah, no, you want to be Bertha, you want to be Bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm trying to take everyone's job here. <laughs> All right, Bertha, thank Bertha, you so thank much. Thank you so much. Happy Monday. <laughs> thank you, guys. Yeah, very Monday. <laughs> All right, now, Caribbean cruise ship scheduled to dock in Miami is actually in the Bahamas this morning to avoid being seized by a U.S. marshal. Well, why? For unpaid fuel bills. So passengers aboard the Crystal Symphony were ferried to Florida as the company says it's suspending operations. NBC News correspondent Carrie Sanders has the story. Well, good morning. Crystal's troubles come as a blow to the industry that's been in troubled waters because of the pandemic. And it also comes as a big surprise because Crystal has such a strong reputation in the industry. But this morning, the cruise ship Symphony is docked in the Bahamas and all the passengers have been safely transported home. This morning, hundreds of passengers and crew of the Crystal Symphony are navigating uncharted waters after their ship originally headed to Miami suddenly diverted to the Bahamas Saturday in an apparent effort to avoid an arrest warrant over unpaid fuel expenses. I left that ship this morning and my friends were still on there and they don't know their fate. They don't know when they're getting off. Musician Elio Pace was working on the ship when it changed course. Who's ever heard of a ship being arrested? And then the reason being because the fuel hasn't been paid for. The drama began last week when Crystal's parent company, Genting Hong Kong, filed for bankruptcy and entered liquidation proceedings. Peninsula Petroleum Far East filed suit in federal court, claiming it's owed more than four and a half million dollars for unpaid fuel bills. Now a judge has issued an arrest warrant for the ship, which means a U.S. Marshal could take charge of the vessel once it enters U.S. waters. We thought we all became pirates. Symphony passengers were taken by ferry to Fort Lauderdale Sunday, including Brad and Tina Oaks, who say they feel badly for the crew. Those people had to be devastated because they knew their jobs were now ending. And they were, it's a pleasure, can I help you, what would you like? And they never stopped that. And I give them big props. Crystal declined to comment on the lawsuit, writing, This end to the cruise was not the conclusion to our guests' vacation we originally planned for. Crystal's guests are among the most passionate and loyal in the cruise industry, and we thank them for their patience and understanding during this challenging time. I'm heartbroken. I actually thought to myself, you know, am I ever going to, am I ever going to be on the ship again? Who knows? Nobody knows. Crystal has suspended operations until at least the end of April. There are 
two ships that are still at sea on voyage. They will eventually end their voyages, but not in U.S. ports. All those on board will be taken back. And if there is a passenger out there for a future cruise on Crystal, the cruise line says they will refund your money. Guys? Ooh, all right, Carrie, thank you so much. And you can be sure you won't find Joe or I on a cruise ship anytime Definitely soon. Definitely not, yet another reason. <laughs> all right, the COVID pandemic took both a physical and emotional toll on the restaurant industry. So those businesses struggled to keep their doors open. Now owners are trying to change the business model by giving more benefits to employees. NBC News senior business correspondent Stephanie Rule takes a closer look. Restaurant work is known for long hours, low wages, and few benefits. COVID could be changing that. It forced a lot of us to look in the mirror, right? Whether it's a change of a job or how we, we operate our businesses. Tom Marolakis is the CEO of Scopos Hospitality Group. It owns six locations in northern New Jersey. COVID still poses a challenge, most recently due to Omicron. In some cases, we were forced to close our restaurants for a week because we had a shortage of team members. Despite the setback, Tom says business is back to pre-COVID levels. But how he does business is different. The company offered health insurance before COVID. Now it's added dental, vision, and a 401k program. Now that you're paying more, are you getting better workers? Absolutely. We're getting individuals that are buying in, that are staying longer, and getting more done at the end of the day. It's similar for Marcus Oliver. He owns Miss Delta in Portland, Oregon. I took a look at the whole business plan and business structure, kind of completely changed how we do things. With a smaller staff, his employees earn more. They now share tips, and almost all are on salary. Additionally, his restaurant is open fewer hours and even closes two days a week. It was really hard at first because I was so stressed out and worried, well, we need that money. And it took, you know, three to four months before I realized that people just started coming the other days. You learned that it was good for business. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Exactly. And, you know, I'm glad I finally did it because I've been wanting to do it for years. Sales are down about 30 percent compared to pre-pandemic, but profits are up and the work has gotten better for everyone. You think it's going to last? Before this, the restaurant was madness all the time. It was just chaos. Now it's really made it a lot easier on everybody to work. Seven years ago, Hannah Chang left her Wall Street job to open Mimi Chang's with her sister. We're really well known for our dumplings. In the first weeks of the okay. pandemic, she worried about its future. At first, we thought we were going to close, and we surveyed our team, and most of them wanted to still work. So we had to figure out a way to stay open. That included shortening hours, shrinking the menu, raising prices, and shipping dumplings to all 50 states. She also increased pay and the pace of raises. I would say they definitely strengthened and made our business more dynamic. But what has bigger implications? The pandemic has united her and thousands of similar mom and pop restaurants to fight for their interests. We are now working together as one big voice in order to affect change in our industry. Like securing health care for low wage restaurant workers. Hannah also hopes the disruptions of the past two years have made diners more understanding. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Cheap food comes at the cost of cheap labor. More and more owners and their employees hope the pandemic has created an appetite for change. Mm. Our thanks to Stephanie Rule for that report. Interesting stuff there. There's still more to come on this hour of Morning News Now. A long lost letter home mailed off overseas during World War II finally delivered nearly 80 years later. Plus a socially distant surprise from a legend of pop that might have some fans calling her postponed Vegas residency water under the bridge. We'll be right back. Welcome back. The widow of a World War II veteran never thought she would hear from her husband again after he passed away six years ago. But an unexpected piece of mail she received just before the holidays changed all that. NBC News correspondent Kate Snow has more. This is a story really about the past coming to life, all thanks to a surprise postal delivery 76 years late. In 1945, World War II ended. Kiss me once, then kiss me twice. Bing Crosby was a jukebox favorite. This is a holiday. Everybody take the day off. A hit on the silver screen, too. And on December 6, 1945, John Gonsalves, a young army sergeant stationed in Germany, penned a letter to his mom back home in Massachusetts. 76 years later, that letter finally showed up at his widow's house. The mailman 
rang my doorbell and he said to me, um, was your husband in the army? And I said, yes, he was. And he said, I do believe that I have something from him. Angelina Gonsalves instantly recognized her husband's handwriting. And I thought, that is unbelievable. It was just a, like a shock. Where the letter's been all this time remains a mystery, but it recently arrived at a Pittsburgh postal facility. Workers there tracked Angelina down through the church listed in her late husband's obituary. I actually felt as though he was here with me when I was reading that letter. Her beloved Johnny died six years ago. But as for the food, it's pretty lousy most all the time. He spoke about everyday things like the food and weather. It was raining and snowing again this morning. Shedding new light on his time overseas. It looks as if I won't be here much longer before I return to the States. A glimpse into the life of service Angelina had heard little about during their 61 years together. Their son Rob says the letter has been a gift the family will treasure forever. He was my hero. We really didn't know a whole lot of that part of his life. Just to get that little sliver of information was, was pretty special. A special reminder of the man she loved so much. And I miss him always. Yep, he'll always be with me. I'll never forget him, that's for sure. John and Angelina had five kids together. She's now a grandmother to six and has three great-grandchildren. And Angelina just celebrated her 90th birthday. So we wish her all the best. Back to you guys. Oh, absolutely. Kate Snow, thank you for that. What an amazing story. What a gift for Where her, Where has too. it been? Oh, that's just so cool to see. All right, now when Adele announced that she'd be postponing her entire Las Vegas residency because of COVID complications with her crew, fans were shocked. Many had already arrived in Vegas or were on <laughs> the way when they got the news. But over the weekend, the hitmaker did what she could to make her fans feel loved. Nine weeks, Adele has been living at the top of the charts. Had no time to choose. Starting Friday, she planned to take up residence at the Coliseum at Caesars Palace in Vegas for her hotly anticipated concert series. I'm really, really sorry. I'm really sorry. Last week, she shocked fans with a last-minute announcement. COVID complications meant the show was being postponed. I'm so sorry, but my show ain't ready. Eleni Sabrakis has been trying to see Adele in concert for years, including 2017, when she flew to London, only to find out Adele was canceling her final performance there. And the Uber driver's name was Adele. And I was like, okay, this is the universe literally laughing in my face. This is a building. <laughs> when she got tickets to Adele's Vegas residency for Christmas, it finally felt like the laughing would stop. And then we fly to Vegas and she cancels her show again. These are Golden Circle tickets. She made a TikTok about her experience that went viral and caught the attention of someone on Adele's team. She was like, no, we loved it. And you know who else loved it? And like turns around her phone and it's Adele on FaceTime. I love you. I'm sorry. I love you. I just FaceTimed Adele. Adele promised to fly Eleni back to Vegas and bring her on stage once the show is rescheduled. Oh my God, it turns out that Adele canceling her show was the best thing that ever happened to me. Across the weekend, Adele surprised a number of fans with messages and calls. Oh my gosh, hi. Including Dominic Crisanino, who spoke with us from the airport before leaving town. He says what happened in Vegas certainly won't be staying there. Now I have this amazing story that I'll carry for the rest of my life. <laughs> the highly anticipated show is called Weekends with Adele. It had been set to run every Friday and Saturday through April at the Coliseum at Caesars Palace. No word yet on when it will be rescheduled, but a lot of <laughs> people are anxious to, her, to go though. back. I know, right? <laughs> best, best canceled plans ever. So She's she, she didn't call everyone, though. You yeah. should note that. Yeah, right? but yeah. those who did get that. That would have been tough. Yes. She would have been busy. <laughs> it would have been her whole... Might have lost weekend. her voice, too. Yeah, exactly. So, and then we had to postpone the show that. again. Oh, my goodness. Exactly. All right. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.